like a bottle of soda with a lot of, a lot of gas in it. I think that there's going to be a chance for him to either slow the progression or to get cured. It's, it's mind-boggling. Family medicine treatment. Hello, I'm Denise White. Welcome to University Beat. The University of South Florida Board of Trustees has a new chairman and vice chair, and both are USF alumni. Brian Lamb was elected chairman at the board's June meeting. He succeeds Hal Mullis. Lamb, who had been vice chair the past two years, is regional president for Fifth Third Bank. He graduated from USF in 1998. As an alumni, you have a number of ways to give back. I choose to give back through public service. Uh, I choose to give back through leadership at the University of South Florida. Uh, and I hope it's a model and an example to give other, get others inspired about staying connected to the institution. We've got a great story to tell here, and it's an exciting place. There are so many other ways to stay involved, and hopefully this is just yet another example of how to do that. This is not the first time Lamb has held a leadership post at USF. He was captain of the Bulls basketball team for three years. And honestly, playing college sports here was a big reason I chose the University of South Florida. But getting a college degree probably is, is paid significantly more dividends in the future. The trustees elected advertising executive Jordan Zimmerman as vice chair. The USF School of Advertising and Mass Communication was named for Zimmerman after he donated $10 million to the university in 2015. Both Zimmerman and Lamb will serve two-year terms. When you think about volcanoes, it's a pretty safe bet you don't think about Florida, but perhaps you should. Some of the world's leading volcano researchers are right here at USF School of Geosciences. When Mount Momotumbo in Nicaragua erupted late last year, they were among the very first scientists on the scene. Momotumbo has a history of violent eruptions. In 1605, the original town of Lyon was destroyed some 30 miles away. The late 1800s saw at least 10 eruptions, but it has been quiet since 1905, and so scientists did not have monitoring equipment in place when it blew early last December. But what triggered that eruption? The volcano behaves almost like a bottle of soda with a lot of, a lot of gas in it. And um, it shook a little bit and exploded. It may have been nearby earthquakes in the months before that caused the volcano's built-up gases to roar to life. The USF team arrived just a few days later. Um, when we got there, actually, it was quiet. And we began setting up some instruments. And uh, a few hours went by, and then suddenly it had a small explosion. By, saw, by small, I mean it sent uh, Volkswagen-sized blocks cascading down the flanks of the volcano, um, setting forest fires and um, uh, sending a shockwave across the countryside. So it was a big explosion. Um, not, not so big as far as volcanic eruptions go, but um, spectacular nevertheless. Grad student Liz Gallant will soon be returning to Momotumbo for more radar studies. Um, there have been a couple more eruptions, um, not a lot of, not as much lava activity, but more explosions. And we want to see if there are any changes that we can uh, measure with that, that instrument. It'll tell us if it's inflating, if it's deflating, if there's any deformation associated with it. And that can tell us kind of about the health of the system below where we can see with our eyes. Florida may seem an unlikely place for a team of world-class volcano researchers. There are, of course, no volcanoes in the Sunshine State. But they have recently begun studying an explosive force right here in Florida, and it mimics the power of a volcano. A rocket is like an upside-down volcano. So we, we didn't get these infrasound sensors very long ago. We wanted to go to a place where we could put them all uh, together and we could record an event that would produce infrasound. Now we don't know when a volcano is going to erupt and there's none here in Florida, but there are rocket launches and we know exactly when they're going to take place. Lava flow is another area USF scientists wanted to research. They want to learn more about how lava behaves as it cools and they needed a way to study it in the lab. The answer, 
a kiln and glass heated to 2,000 degrees. The volcanic eruptions are rare. It's very hard to go see a lava flow or see a volcanic explosion. Glass is a silicate. It's a silicate melt. Um, and magma is a silicate melt. That means they behave roughly in a similar fashion. So we can use hot glass to mimic the properties of lava, for example. And so we can see how volcanoes might behave under different circumstances, but control those conditions. Although USF volcanologists don't forecast eruptions, their data helps other scientists to better understand volcanoes and possibly to warn people before an eruption. I've seen eruptions which have killed tens of thousands of people, and that's horrible. And I would like to do research that helps us uh, prevent that kind of catastrophe in the future. Professor Chuck Connor now joins us on set. Professor, welcome to University Beat. It's good to be here. That must have been so amazing to see that eruption uh, in person. It, describe the experience. Yeah, it got our attention. We, we uh, arrived uh, in Nicaragua, and within 12 hours, we were on the volcano. Um, we were setting up our gear, and uh, suddenly we heard an explosion. And, uh, uh, Volkswagen-sized bombs were flying through the air on the volcano, setting forest fires. A big gas plume rose over the volcano, and uh, we were able to see that uh, at a safe distance, but uh, it was spectacular. Is one eruption from a volcano different from another? Absolutely. Um, so some, Well, some volcanoes have used lava flows, and those are spectacular and are hazardous to people living near the volcano, but basically it's just a, a beautiful show that nature puts on. And then others are explosive, and those are much more dangerous, and those volcanoes have far-reaching effects. So we definitely want to know the difference between a volcano that's going to erupt lavas or one that will explode. And the same volcano can do it, you know, either type of activity at a different point in time. We're used to having hurricane experts in Florida, but it's unusual to have volcanologists in Florida. You know, basically USF is a global research university, so we want to solve global problems, and volcanoes are a global problem. Uh, people live nearby, um, are at risk from the volcanoes, their lives are at risk, their economies are at risk, but volcanoes also have worldwide impacts, so we want to understand those as well. So even though Floridians aren't affected by volcanoes directly. We don't have to worry about the lava flows coming here or anything like that. But uh, um, our climate is affected by volcanoes. Our economy is potentially affected. So we're part of the global community. We need to know what's going on. Why do you make a distinction between predicting, in quotes, a volcano yeah. eruption and forecasting a volcano eruption? Right. Prediction has a lot to do you know, uh, with, with certainty and, and being sure you're able to say when the volcano will erupt. And we're actually not able to say with certainty when a volcano will erupt. So like a meteorologist, we make a forecast. Uh, you know, the meteorologist will say, there's a 30% chance of rain tomorrow, and you understand what that means inherently, that it's, there's a chance it'll rain, there's a chance it might not. And that's what we have to do in volcano, volcanology as well. We have to forecast eruptions. And, when the probability is high and we're relatively sure, then people respond. Do you think we're getting closer to the day in which we might pr be able to predict a volcanic eruption? Well, we're getting better and better at, at understanding when volcanoes will erupt, um, uh, mostly from improved monitoring networks, both from space and on the flanks of volcanoes. So some volcanoes are very well monitored and people can forecast eruptions sometimes to the day. Uh, with pretty good accuracy. Um, but there are big questions we haven't answered yet. So for example, like well, it's, it's hard to know how big a volcanic eruption will be. You know, one level, if the eruption is small and it erupts, that's, that's good for business. It's good for tourism. People come and look at it. Uh, on the other hand, if the eruption is, is large, um, it can be quite dangerous and it can potentially kill a lot of people. So. We want to be able to forecast the magnitude of the eruption, and so far we're not so good at that. Um, we're making progress, but we're going to do a lot more science before we can make those kinds of forecasts. Dr. Connor, thank you for being on University Beat. It's a pleasure. 
There's a section of the botanical gardens here at USF that provides a bridge between the medical present and the past. It's called the Medicinal Gardens, where you can learn how Native Americans used herbs and plants to treat illness and maintain health. Kim Hutton is the program coordinator, and here in her own words, she shares with us some examples. Seminoles had the medicine man, and the medicine man had all the recipes, and he was the one that would make the brew up and give it to his clients, his patients. Goji berry is also always an interesting one. It's become very popular now because it has um, high vitamin C, and it has high um, iron in it as well. It's got like 16 times the, the iron that you would find in spinach. So it's a really good, nutritious um, berry. People eat the berries. They make juices out of it. It's also used to, um, it can help cure insomnia, and it helps on digestive. It's anti-inflammatory, antibacterial, um, so it's used for a lot of different things. Chocolate mint is, as, as with all the mints, is really good for the digestive system, and that's usually what the mints are used for, calming and digestive. We have two kinds of coffee. We have the, the coffee that you find um, when you're having your morning coffee, and then we also have the local, what's called wild coffee plant. It's Psychotria nervosa. However, um, that one has been used to make a drink by the pioneers and the um, local people that came to the area, but it it's really has no caffeine in it at all. So The yarrow is really good for colds and flus and digestive. It's also good as an external treatment for wounds. We have um, the, the blackberry lily down there, and that's used um, to help for insomnia, it's used for digestive, and it's used um, for prostate cancer. We're talking historical, cultural aspects of medicinal plants, so we're saying this is what they've been used in the past. This plant may have been used by our forefathers for something, but there's value in that if we look at that scientifically, so we can incorporate uh, modern medicine with the, the cultures of the past. That's what we're trying to do here. Elsewhere on the Tampa campus, some groundbreaking research is underway into Huntington's disease. It's a genetic disorder, and it can be devastating both to the patient and to the people who love and care for them. Hedel Gandhi introduces us to a couple dealing with this disease. Vicki Owen fell in love with her husband, Tom, the minute she laid eyes on him on the dance floor. The couple got married 27 years ago, and they've been inseparable ever since. He's got a great sense of humor. Just, he's funny. <laughs> he was funny, still is. Together, they enjoyed an active lifestyle. Tom was athletic and loved sports, including basketball, volleyball, and NASCAR. I have stuff in the room, I have the room where I can tell you, what I did with the NASCAR driving experience, unbelievable. Best thing I ever did. But about six years ago, Vicki noticed a big change. He was having difficulty focusing at work, um, remembering names, very short temper. They came to see Dr. Juan Sanchez Ramos, a professor of neurology at USF, who diagnosed Tom with Huntington's disease. I didn't like it. I didn't like it at all. We were in shock because we had no idea what it was, you know. The genetic disorder causes nerve cells in the brain to break down over time. Huntington's patients have a 50% chance of passing it on to their children. It wasn't until after his diagnosis that Tom learned there were 16 people in his family with the disease. Uh, when we started looking symptoms and things up about Huntington's online, it was really scary. Cognitive decline, problems with thinking and concentration and planning ahead. Emotional issues, most commonly depression, but it could be mania, obsessive compulsive disorders. And thirdly, what it's well known for is the appearance of involuntary movements, dance-like movements known as chorea. Dr. Sanchez Ramos is on the forefront of Huntington's research. He was part of the team that identified the gene that causes the disease back in 1993, and he's been searching for a cure ever since. In simple words is that we are designing a special vehicle, uh, like almost like a synthetic virus that we can load with the drug, 
put it into a nasal spray and it can be delivered into the nose and transported from the nerve endings in the nose to the brain. He's still testing the ability to use this nasal spray to deliver gene silencing nanoparticles to the brain in mice. But so far, the research by the USF team is so impressive, the National Institute of Health awarded the team $2.3 million. The grant really is designed to really work out the mechanism by which this works and work out little details like how much of the drug we need to load in each nanoparticle, how often do we have to administer it, how much of the drug actually gets into the brain, how does it distribute across brain, and for how long is it silenced, how often do we have to administer this. So there's many, many, many questions that will be addressed over the next five years that will be instrumental for getting it to the next level, which would be a nasal spray for humans with Huntington's disease. Since these particles need to be administered directly to the brain, the only other option out there right now is using a procedure similar to an epidural. The safety and tolerability of a nasal spray compared to safety and tolerability of surgical procedures for delivering a drug is no comparison. A non-invasive solution that is key, especially since researchers still don't know how often patients would need those treatments. That his doctor is doing the research is just amazing. And to think that there's going to be a chance for him to either slow the progression or to get cured is, it's mind boggling. Hope for Vicki, Tom, and so many people affected by this heartbreaking disease. Yeah, I do, I love Vicki. She's the good, and she did everything. She takes care of me, you know? So that's nice to have somebody that'll do that for you. I love doing things for him. It's, what, the, what is hard is that I have to do it and that he can't do these things for himself any longer. One of Tom's biggest struggles is swallowing. It's one of the reasons he's lost so much weight. I get his medicine ready for him every day. I make sure he eats and I have to find things that he can eat he has difficulty eating anymore. She's good about that. She really knows how to take care of me. She's found out what I like and don't like, and we have a good it from there. I don't always eat at all, but I eat as much as I can. Vicki misses the active lifestyle she once shared with Tom. We wanted to do things, travel, and can't do it anymore. She continues to help other families through a support group. She even wrote a chapter about her experience dealing with the disease. But Vicki still struggles with the burden of doing it all on her own. I feel lonely. We don't have, you know, friends here. We don't have family here. But it's a lot of hardship on me and on my wife, Vicki, and I just think that it's, we got to do something else. And I don't know what it is. And I, I guess to get tired of being tired. Tom doesn't like to do much besides watching TV these days. And Vicki worries about him suffering from depression. Worrying where our lives are going, where his life is going, finances. And I hate doing those. <laughs> But I just wor I worry about everything because it's all on me now. At times, they feel hopeless. But Dr. Sanchez Ramos tells Tom and all his patients that he's doing everything he can to stop this disease. An optimism that Vicki and Tom have to hold on to because it's all they've got. For University Beat, I'm Hedel Gandhi. It was record-setting, and it was certainly exciting. The USF softball team won 23 games in a row this past season. That was the longest winning streak in school history, and at the time was the longest active streak in the nation. The Bulls finished the season with a record of 45-16, and 15-3 and in the American Athletic Conference. Firefighters face danger on a daily basis, but the most common injury they suffer may surprise you. Not burns, 
but lower back injuries caused by the physical demands of their jobs. USF Health is teaming up with some Bay Area fire departments on a federally funded study of methods to reduce back injuries. A firefighter that sustains a back injury can have pain for the rest of his life. It can be a debilitating injury that results in him having to retire early. If it doesn't result in him having to retire early, it often is a very costly recovery time. Firefighters wear about 50 pounds of protective gear, including their air pack. And they often carry as much as 40 pounds of additional equipment. Add to that the possibility of having to carry a 200-pound person out of a fire. Indeed, there is a relationship between poor physical fitness, deconditioning, and firefighters that have back pain or back injury. And that led us to develop an exercise intervention that we tested in the previous study with Tampa Fire Rescue. Now, backed by a grant from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, USF Health is studying ways to prevent back injuries. So we couldn't be more pleased to partner and collaborate with an institution of such significance like the University of South Florida to get this out because our entire industry will be positively impacted for this study and by this study. The intervention includes stretching and a workout utilizing a variable angle Roman chair, a specialized machine that strengthens lower back muscles. The chair enables a quick and convenient workout. And the biggest thing for firefighters that we've seen is how much time is it going to take me? You know, am I going to have to go places to do the exercises? So it really works because it really only takes 10 minutes. They do it in their clothing. They don't have to change. And if they get a call in the middle of the exercises, they just leave. Results from the study are expected in the fall. For modern day medical students, few days are more important than match day. That's when they find out where they'll spend their residencies, the next step in their training. Nearly 200 graduates of the USF Health Marsani College of Medicine recently found out where they're headed. As University Beat's Mark Schreiner reports, it was a day of excitement and a fair share of drama. Where else but the University of South Florida Match Day are you going to see one med school student propose to another, a dog in a t-shirt, and the dean of the Morsani College of Medicine in a pirate costume. At Ohio State, for example, where I came from, this was a very formal thing and everybody got dressed up you know, in suits and um, the physicians all wore white coats and it was very formal. Um, this is much more fun and much less stressful. <laughs> More on the celebration in a moment, but first, some information about Match Day. During their fourth year of med school, students interview at hospitals and medical centers around the country and rank their preferred destinations to do their residencies. The facilities also rank the students, only with hundreds of names on their lists. It is their most important day. Um, it's probably, uh, having gone through it myself, I can tell you that there's no day that has more stress uh, and usually happiness at the end, but you don't know where your future will be. You could be uh, across the country at, at, at a residency program, or you could be staying here or anywhere in between. 42,000 applicants applied for 30,000 positions nationwide, with the results being announced simultaneously around the country. But few med schools made it the event USF did, with family and friends joining students at Eulalie Restaurant in downtown Tampa on a sun-drenched Friday morning. Playing into Tampa's love of all things pirate, the mystic crew of Gasparilla delivered the envelopes containing the students' matches. We were just handed some things. I don't know, do y'all want to see what's in here? Or? And with luck playing a part in matching, nervousness was the order of the day. And then as soon as they called my name, I kind of felt like I got punched in the stomach a little bit. But uh, and I read I read the sheet about twice just to make sure I didn't say the wrong place. But uh, I was very excited. A number of couples matched as spouses are paired in either the same hospital or the same city. I'll be doing orthopedic surgery. And I'll be doing emergency medicine at Washington University in St. Louis. Jonathan and Monique Costco met as undergraduate study buddies six and a half years ago at USF and got married earlier this year. Jonathan, who played for the USF baseball team, was drafted by the Tampa Bay Rays just two weeks after being accepted into medical school. I went and played a year, um, have 
great experience, and I'm glad it happened because at the time, Monique was a year behind me in school, and so it worked out perfectly timing that now we're in the same class, we're able to match together, go to the same city. It, everything about it was perfect. You think he did that deliberately? <laughs> I don't know about that, but... For many of the students, Match Day was an opportunity to celebrate years of hard work and the people who helped them get here. One of the first things Neil Gackard did after learning he'll be practicing internal medicine at the University of Colorado, Denver, was hug his parents. It feels surreal. It's amazing out here. It's a, it's a beautiful day with all, all my friends and family, and I can't be more thankful right now. Oh, I'm so proud. <laughs> this is just such a blessing. Thank you, Mom. Yes, he's worked very hard. Oh, yes. It's a thrill. And for the students, even the ones who'll do their residencies at USF, Match Day was a last chance to be together before the next step in their lives begins. I think the hardest thing is actually leaving our, you know, big family of med students. We've gotten to know each other all so well and just to see everyone part their different ways is sad but also exciting for all of us. We know we can visit each other and everyone's really excited, still enjoying the day. For University Beat, I'm Mark Schreiner. If there's a story about the University of South Florida you'd like to see us cover, please let us know. Our email is ubeat at wusf.org. Our website is universitybeattv.org. And you can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search University Beat TV. And that wraps it up for this week's edition of University Beat. Thank you for joining us. I'm Denise White.